All right, welcome everybody to our second web webcast on PPP loan and the developments around it. I'm Mike Crabtree. I'm a tax partner at Boule, and with me today is Tom Johnson, who is also a tax partner at Boule, and Jeff Filler, who is a manager in our audit area, who heads up our, our risk advisory area, and he's been taking the lead on a lot of our um, PPP loan forgiveness consulting. So the two of them will help in, in delivering our, uh, our message today. And I, I wanna say right off the top that when we scheduled this event, uh, we were pretty confident that we would have a whole bunch uh, more guidance than we had last time. And that we would have a lot of the, the questions that everybody has around the PPP loan program answered. Um, and unfortunately that has not happened. We are still waiting for a considerable amount of guidance from the SBA and banks are in the same boat. So we're all kind of in a holding pattern. Um, so for today's presentation, I think we're gonna you know, talk a little bit about some of the things that have happened and, and things we do know. But the, the majority of this, I hope, will be um, kind of a question and answer type situation and you know to do that hopefully if you, you're able to um, hover at the bottom of your screen you'll see a, a Q&A box so if you can click on that it should open a box that will allow you to type in a question and Tom and Jeff will look at those and we'll kind of go back and forth on, on um, hopefully getting those answered so again the Q&A box down below and type in your question and we'll go ahead. All right. Okay, so as everyone knows, the PPP loans, the Paycheck Protection Program, is part of the, the CARES Act. Um, it seems like old news now. Um, March 27th is when that came out. It's been a uh, a real roller coaster ride um, as far as the rules changing a lot and, and people's expectations. Um, there's been a lot of changes, constant changes. For a while, the SBA was putting out new guidance almost certainly weekly, sometimes daily. Um, but as I said earlier, that has kind of dried up now. So the main Two pieces of the, pay, the PPP loans are the loan itself, which is governed under Section 1102 of the, of the CARES Act, and then the forgiveness aspect of it. Because while these are phrased as loans, and, and that's how they're structured, the real intent is for them to be grants. They, they want these loans to be forgiven. The idea was to pump out money into the economy, save jobs. And in order to get forgiveness, you had to spend the money on certain eligible expenses, which we have uh, discussed before. And then there are a couple of different tests to that could possibly limit your forgiveness, depending on whether or not you kept your employees and kept their wages constant. And then we've discussed those before as well. Big change came to the PPP program in the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act, which was enacted on June 5th. And we talked about this, this was brand new and the last time we had a, a webcast. And this really changed the, the playing field significantly. Um, the original PPP loan had an eight week covered period that you could spend the funds and get forgiveness on. This tripled that um, from an eight-week period to a 24-week period. So if you'll remember, the, the loan amount you originally got was based on two and a half months of your 2019 payroll, which roughly comes to about 10.8 weeks worth of payroll. And so there's an inherent kind of uh, disconnect between the 10.8 weeks of the payroll you got the loan based on, and then you only had eight weeks uh, of payroll costs to, um, to get forgiveness. 
So, it, but there were other expend, expenses that we were able to add into that, you know, certain interest, rent, um, you know, other types of eligible expenses. So, some people were able to get 100% forgiveness out of eight weeks, but many, many businesses weren't. So, this was a huge, huge deal when this changed from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Um, so that being said, if the eight weeks works for you, you can still elect to use the eight weeks. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, in previous guidance, the SBA had said you needed to spend at least 75% of, uh, of your PPP funds on payroll expenses, and the PPP FA reduced that to 60%. Um, in some cases, that, that matters. Um, the change from eight weeks to 24 weeks should make that less of an issue. Um, and there were also some, some changes and some clarification about what to do if you don't get complete forgiveness and it really is or remains a loan. Um, one of the big things there was some, some uh, certainty about how that works. And and this is also another question that's been coming up a lot, which is when do I need to apply for forgiveness? And what the PPPFA said is, okay, to the extent that your PPP loan remains a loan, you will start paying that back either the sooner of, either when the SBA pays the bank the forgiven piece or 10 months after your covered period ends. So if for some reason you never apply for forgiveness, then your PPP loan will be a loan and you'll start making payments 10 months after your covered period. Um, covered periods, the earliest, now that covered periods are 24 months, go, and if the first loans came out in early April, I think you'd probably, so the covered periods couldn't really end before the end of September, early October. So the first loan payments then would probably start next summer, next August, something like that. So, and, and that is the outside window. So you really do have a long time to, um, to decide whether to apply for forgiveness. We're assuming most people will. Um, but there's really no urgency about it. And there was some kind of uncertainty, and that's a question that we get a lot is, when do I have to get my application in? Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, but there's, there's really no urgency. And the fact is, the fact that we don't have all the guidance we need is also kind of taking, taking the foot off the gas. Hey, Mike, can I interrupt here? Just yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, terrific. First, um, just to let everyone know, the audio was going in and out before, but I think it is fixed now, so just make sure that you're pointing yourself right at your computer, so that's okay. great. Um, you may have answered this here, but the, the very first question that came in was the question of between eight weeks and 24 weeks. What happens if I spend my money in 10 weeks? Do I have to wait? And you may have addressed that, but if you could just address that again, that would be great. Sure. I, I didn't direct that, um, address that directly. And that is the absolute number one question that is still hanging out there. It's what happens if, in your example, I take my PPP money, I can't spend it all in eight weeks, but I spend it all in 12 weeks. So it's all gone. I've spent it all on eligible expenses, which means I should get 100% forgiveness. This is a really, um, <laughs> it, it shouldn't be that hard, but, but it, it, it's, it's a thorny question because the guidance that has come out from the SBA clearly says that you can apply for forgiveness before your 24 weeks are up. But it doesn't change the fact that the full-time equivalency tests and, and the salary reduction test have to be computed over the covered period 
And if the covered period isn't eight weeks, it's 24 weeks. So they haven't told us how we work around that. And I think that's the biggest question. And my suspicion is, is that's why we haven't seen the guidance yet is because they're trying to square those two issues because they've clearly said in their own guidance that we don't have to wait all 24 weeks to, to file for forgiveness. And there are some situations where if you can avail yourself of one of the safe harbors that um, either in the CARES Act itself or in the, the PPP Flexibility Act, then the full-time equivalent employee test doesn't apply to you and the salary reduction test doesn't apply to you. So then really there's no reason um, that you wouldn't get 100% forgiveness and, and you should be able to file your application for forgiveness and, and get it forgiven. But most people will be in that situation. Well, you know, I haven't laid anybody off. I haven't reduced any wages, but I'm only halfway through my 24 weeks. And if you apply now, it's almost like, are you committing to, to, to not lay anybody off or reduce rate, any wages? I mean, you, it's like you're in the future. And, um, and that I think is, is, is the big unanswered question. Mike, I want to add something as well on this subject. So um, we're always hoping for guidance on um, how to apply after 12, 16, 20 weeks. Hopefully that gets clarified. But I've been telling clients that, you know, worst case scenario, let's say they don't come out with any sort of guidance and make you choose between eight or 24. The eight week option doesn't go away, right, Mike? I mean, they can still use the qualifications and the calculations based off of eight weeks and then compare to what is their situation at 24 weeks and choose whichever one gives them more forgiveness. So if you have an FTE reduction, you know, if using the 24 week period, um, then, you know, you just compare what your forgiveness amount is and go with the one that gives you higher, higher value. So um, don't want to feel that, you know, if you don't use the eight week period now and you don't apply now that you have to go to 24 weeks and they won't even accept your application. That's not, that's not what we've been hearing. Exactly right, Jeff. Yeah. And the, the eight week covered period is an election that people can make. And it's actually only available to people who got their loans before the PPPFA came out in, on June 5th. So you had to have received your PP loan before June 5th in order to even use the eight week covered period. Um, but you're right, that, that's an election you make with your forgiveness application. So assuming you got your loan before June 5th, you can decide which covered period gives you the better answer and, and, and use that covered period when you, um, when you do apply for forgiveness. Okay, so I think we're hearing that your time periods right now that we know of are eight weeks or 24 weeks, but that we don't know if we can use 12 weeks or 16 weeks as far as th that's the big unanswered question. As far as we wouldn't know how to, we wouldn't know how to calculate it. The cover, what, what covered period would we use to calculate exactly. what the reference periods are? That's the question. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we're kind of in this limbo. Um, but, and that being said, the PPPFA did, it changed the landscape for the better. Um, and, and definitely made the prospects for total forgiveness a lot better for a lot of a lot of businesses. The only other really huge thing legislatively that's happened since then is that the PPP program itself got extended. Um, just a real quick little one shot, um, very short little statute ran through over the holiday. Uh, right at the end, the, the original rule was that the PPP program went through June 30th. And, and they weren't a lot. Mike, we're losing you a little bit here again. Okay. Is this any better? Am I back? Okay. Yeah, the, the original PPP program went through June 30th. Um, and then so right on, right on June 30th, uh, Congress ran uh, a quick extension through. And the president signed it on July 4th. And what that did is it kept the window open 
to make PPP loans up until the 8th of August. So we still can apply for a PPP loan. Um, under the CARES Act, you can only get one PPP loan. So if you've already applied and received your loan, then, then you don't, uh, can't get another one. But the, uh, if someone who hasn't applied, hasn't received their PPP loan, the door is still open um, and, 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 and should be considered. August 8th is kind of, it's getting closer to being right around the corner. And I think, I think some, some banks are, are saying, well, they're cutting it off somewhat before that so that they have time to handle their application process and get everything issued by August 8th. But that's going to depend um, kind of bank to bank. The other, um, yeah, maybe along these same lines, there's a question for you here. If my 24 week period ends in September, do I use September for restoring FTEs or do I wait till 1231? Do I have to wait till 1231 to restore? 24 weeks, it's the earlier of, right? September or 1231? Okay, so so it is the September number, September date here in this example. Yeah, I think December thirty one is just that's the latest you can go. Perfect. Okay, and that, that brings up another idea, which is the the twenty four week period has that twelve thirty one cap on it. So we're actually past the point now where um, there aren't twenty four weeks left of of twenty twenty. So if you got a loan today or tomorrow, you wouldn't, you'd have slightly less than 24 weeks as your covered period, because all covered periods have to end on 1231. So just an aside. <laughs> but another, um, another thing that has happened, I'm not sure how much we discussed this at the last web, webcast, but when the, the first PPP applications came out, there was a a lot of consternation about it because it was 11 pages and a lot of work and a lot of a lot of computation. Um, and then after the the PPP FA came out, the SBA issued an EZ version of um, of the loan application or loan forgiveness application. And in order to use this EZ form, you have to be able to check one of these boxes. So essentially three avenues to get to use the easy form. The first one is um, really straightforward. And this is for your uh, Schedule C filer, your person who has uh, an independent contractor or a self-employed person who doesn't have any employees. So they're really just self-employed doing their own thing in their own business, reporting their reporting their um, business profits on Schedule C as part of their 1040. If you're one of those folks, you check that box, you can use the EZ form. It's very straightforward, um, not a lot of computation involved. The other two avenues for using the EZ form, the second box, which I think is gonna be um, open to a lot of people, is you have to be able to basically say yes to these to these things. The first one is that you didn't reduce any salary or, or wages of any employee by more than 25%. And, and that's that salary reduction test that was part of the, the CARES Act itself. Um, you do get, you, you get a, a free pass on the first 25% reduction. So if you, if you had reduced your employee salaries 20% across the board, um, you could still check yes to this because it's, it's not more than 25%. But so, so the first thing is you have to be able to say that we did not reduce salary or hours by more than 25%. And, and the, the ands are important in these. You did not reduce the number of employees or the average paid hours of employees between January 1, 2020 and the end of your covered period. In, this is getting back to that question too of, of the covered period, because if I have a 24 week covered period, then I have to know what happens over those 24 weeks in order to be able to check yes to this. So hopefully what they'll do is 
is they'll shorten that for us when they do come out with this guidance and say, okay, if I've spent my money after 12 weeks, I should be able to apply for forgiveness after 12 weeks and the covered period will really just be the 12 weeks. But they haven't done that yet. Um, but that would make this a whole a lot simpler. So to check that box, you didn't have any salary reduction and you didn't include, uh, decrease your full-time equivalent employee headcount. Um, so that, I, that box, I think a lot of people are gonna be able to check. The third box is, relates to another of the safe harbors. And that, it, and that one is, it starts with the same, is that you didn't reduce salary or hourly wages by more than 25%. And you are able to document that your, your business is unable to return to the level of business activity that you had on February 15th um, due to compliance with government requirements. Essentially, the government closes you down. This, this will apply to restaurants and other you know, movie theaters, things where the, um, the government really did come in and say, okay, you can't open, or you, have to be, you have to be shut down. Um, so if you can document that, then, then you can check the box here and use the easy form. And the easy form is a lot simpler than the, um, than the long form because you're not doing that same, you're not doing the employee by employee analysis of full-time equivalency and analyzing hours and things like that. So, because the, the long form still is long, it is still the longer form and there are worksheets and schedules that need to be completed. Um, and it, it is still a process. So, and maybe talking about that, maybe that's a good segue um, to talk to you, Jeff, about how this has been going so far. Um, we, we've really just started going down the road of forgiveness applications. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss this a little bit later, but I think you know most banks aren't willing to accept them at this point because it's, they don't have the, the guidance they need. But we are starting to, to help clients work with um, the computations necessary to, to complete their forgiveness applications. And, and as I said earlier, Jeff has been spearheading that. So Jeff, do you have any um, kind of comments so far as how that process has been going? Yeah, I mean, there's just kind of two companies we alluded to earlier. Uh, we have the clients, a few of them, who've used all their money within eight weeks. So we tell them, you know, you can go ahead and apply if your bank is ready to accept the application. Um, then we have the clients who are kind of, in the other bucket where, you know, they didn't use it all within eight weeks and they don't want to walk away from forgiveness. So they are going to the 24 weeks and we're telling them to hope for, you know, additional guidance that comes out sooner. But again, as I mentioned earlier, the eight week period is always going to be there for you. It's not going to go away. They're not going to say you have to use eight weeks. And if you don't do it now, if you don't apply now, then you won't be able to do it later. Um, you know, you'll still be able to choose between the two. So for those that haven't spent the money within eight weeks, um, we just recommend, uh, to move to 24 and, you know, we'll hopefully we'll get more guidance and we'll be able to put this application behind you sooner and not have to wait out the full period. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it it's, it's, it's natural to want to, to want to get this into the rear view mirror, you know, of, it's, it's been a interesting process full of, I mean, there's been a lot of consternation as, as to, well, should I apply? Is it okay if I apply? Um, there was a lot of discussion. It's like, am I really eligible? Will I get in trouble if it turns out that I didn't need the money? And there were all sorts of issues like that. And I don't know. I, I think those have kind of fallen off, off, off the radar. I'm, I'm not hearing those same kind of discussions anymore. Um, and it, again, and we've seen what's been happening in in the country. I mean, maybe not as much in Minnesota, but in a lot of the southern states where they've had their, their, their COVID occurrences were going down and now they're spiking up again, which still leads to way more uncertainty. Um, uncertainty is... Mike or Jeff, along some of those lines, there have been a number of questions about my employees going down and the reason employees are going down. You've talked a little bit about the restaurants that they can't open or because of you know government intervention, but what happens if 
you had five employees and two of them quit. And so your number of employees goes down. Is that an excuse? Or, you know, talk a little bit about the situation about employees going down. For sure. Yeah. The, um, and there has been some clarification on that. And that was a, a huge question at the beginning. Um, you know, what if I don't lay off any employees, but I have a couple employees that, that choose to leave? Uh, and the SBA did clarify that in um, some of their interim final rules, some of the guidance they issued, where they said that um, if you have to terminate an employee for cause, or if an employee leaves on their own, you don't count that as a reduction in your headcount. So essentially you get to keep them on, on the payroll in your, in your full-time equivalent computations. You don't need to back them out because you didn't terminate them. They, they left on their own um, or they you know, left for cause and because you had to fire them for, for one reason or another. Um, and, and then there was also another safe harbor that was created in that PPP Flexibility Act that said, if you can document that you, you had to let some employees go and you offered to hire them back, uh, but they refused, or that you haven't been able to um, replace them with similarly qualified people, then you also get to um, kind of leave them out of the, the computation. So you're, you're not dinged for employees that you lose in those situations. So. Okay. And there are a couple questions that are going to apply to that. And I'm thinking of the, the SBA or somebody really um, analyzing these things. So the questions have come up. We've read a lot about uh, loans under $150,000 not being audited and just being automatically forgiven, which this is the kind of situation that's perfect for that. I mean, who in the world is going to come and decide whether that employee left voluntarily or whether you were going to be able to replace that person? So I think this is an opinion question. Two of them in here, but less than $150,000, do you think it will be automatically forgiven? And there was also that $2 million that was floating around there that we're going to audit slash review greater than 2 million, not under that. Give us a little insight into that, if one of you would. For sure, yeah, and, and those are two different things. The, the $2 million threshold is there. They've, they've gone on record and saying that they are going to review all loans over 2 million bucks. Uh, and there's a box that you check on the forgiveness application. You know, yes, I'm over 2 million. Um, but they should also be able to tell that from the numbers on the <laughs> forgiveness application, but there is actually a box that is checked. Um, I, I question whether or not the SBA will have either the manpower or, or, or really the incentive to, to, to do a real thorough deep dive into all the facts surrounding any PPP loan, really. Um, I, I, I just don't know how that's going to work. Um, there are tens of thousands of these things out there over, that are over $2 million. And the SBA is, is not geared to, um, they don't have the manpower, they don't have the staff to really um, dig into this for, in, in a way like the IRS does, for example. The IRS is set up to examine returns. Um, I don't think the SBA has that kind of capacity. Um, doesn't mean that you shouldn't do everything accurately, but I, I, I don't foresee a huge um, level of scrutiny, even on the big loans. Unless, of course, they have some other reason to dig into it, and you never know what, what that could be. The $150,000 question, that, that's something that I've seen bandied about by certain members of Congress as, as a suggestion as to one way to deal with just the sheer number, the millions of PPP loans out there. Some of them are really small. Um, like for example, the, the Schedule C ones that we were looking at before, no matter how much you made on your Schedule C, and if you don't have any employees, the maximum loan amount was 
20,800. So there are just tons of those out there and it doesn't make any sense really to make people do a lot of computations in, in order to establish that, that they get full forgiveness because at least in that situation, you're almost guaranteed to have full forgiveness. But a lot of other like, really small businesses don't have the resources. Even on the easy form, there's instructions that you need to follow in, in terminology, and you've got to be able to you know, do some analysis to figure out if you can check these boxes and, and qualify for it. And, it. and I think a lot of... Um, there is a, a, a movement in Congress to just say, you know, it's, it, it's not worth putting everybody. Okay. It looks like Mike froze up there for a second. So maybe I'll jump in until he, he comes back. Um, there are other I questions that, out there. Was, and that's why that's, I don't know that anything. Yeah. Sorry, Mike, you froze up there for a second. Oh, sorry. Yep. And, and so there are a couple other things, that, you know, related questions, especially to your self-employed questions. Is the limit 20,833 for, you know, for the 24-week self-employed person? That's correct, right? Um, similar question, self-employed people and their retirement plans. I think if you're a self-employed person, you're just stuck at the 20,833. Doesn't matter if you made a retirement plan contribution or, or things like that. Correct. Well, yeah. I mean, your loan, if you're self-employed, I mean, your, your loan amount itself would have been capped at that 2833 and that's all you could have borrowed. And so that's all you could get forgiven. Um, there are some caps on, people who have self-employment income, like for example, in a, in a partnership, you have an operating LLC where you've got some, some partner owners and then you've got a whole bunch of employees. Um, there are some specific caps in that and, and that has been kind of clarified in, in the instructions to these forms. The way that works is, so if I am, let's say I'm a, an operating partnership where I've got some partners, some owner, partners, and then I've got a bunch of employees. When I'm using that 24 week period, I get to use, I have to cap my employee wages at $100,000 annually. And for my employees, that comes out to, you know, 24, 50 seconds of, of 100,000, which is I think 46,000 or something, which would be the cap on any employee payroll costs for my owners, my, the people getting self-employment income, they are capped at the two and a half months uh, of, um, of compensation. So unlike regular employees the, where you get to use the whole 24 week period for your owner employees, if you call them employees, but your, your self-employed owners, um, they are essentially capped at what they used for the uh, on the front end on the borrowing piece, so the two and a half months. Um, so is that? Yeah, I think that answers the question. And the other part of that question is: Does it matter if that employee owner owns one percent or fifty percent or anything? I think it's any ownership. It's so part of the yeah, yeah. That that is one more piece of guidance that we're hoping that they'll have some kind of de minimis threshold on because you think about it, I mean, you, you could have a 1%, yeah, a 1% owner versus a 50% owner. They're not really in the same boat, but um, as far as we know now, it just says employee owner. So I would take that face value and say, if I own any, any amount, any percentage, I, I think I fall in that bucket. Um, but it, it would not surprise me if they put some kind of de minimis threshold on there when they do finally issue some guidance on that. Now, and a related question to that would be, um, this is something we've wrestled with a little bit, what about your ESAP situation where 
you know, your, your business is owned by, by an ESOP, uh, an employee stock ownership program. So essentially almost all your employees are owners in a way. Do we look through that? I mean, and I haven't seen anything that says we do, but um, ESOP owned companies are, are always, um, are usually pretty interested in saying, yes, we're employee owned. <laughs> Does that mean all my employees are subject to that cap? I don't know. Just a, another unknown that we've got floating out there. Yeah, and Jeff, there are a number of questions out here about are the banks accepting applications? Can we file for forgiveness now? What are you seeing as you're walking through this? And I'll start with Jeff, and then maybe Mike, you can answer as well. Yeah, I haven't seen anyone that I've worked with actually submit an application yet. I've gotten some correspondence from banks saying they're waiting on guidance from the SBA. Um, but listen, I mean, if you've spent all your money after eight weeks, you have all the information you need. If your bank is willing to accept your application, then I see no reason why you can't apply. Um, how long it'll take for them to process? I'm not sure. Don't they have 60 days, Mike? Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of hits on something that I, I heard kind of remotely from, from a bank that one of my colleagues has some relationship to is that banks are a little bit concerned because statutorily, I mean, it's right in the CARES Act, the bank has 60 days to approve or deny your forgiveness application. And they are in a spot where they, from, from everything I've heard, they are not able to actually process SBA through the SBA these forgiveness applications they they need guidance as to how that's going to work so they don't want to start that 60-day clock ticking while they can't do anything about it um, so I think my understanding is from from what I've been hearing is that banks aren't aren't, aren't very eager to accept these applications some of them are just saying no we, we, we won't accept them now um, maybe some of them are accepting them and then just kind of putting them in a drawer until they can get the rest of the rules. Um, but I, I think that's, so not only on our end where we're calculating the forgiveness amounts, we have a lot of open questions. The banks on the processing side have a whole bunch of open, open issues that they need resolved before they can uh, make things work on their end. With your banker, I mean, and that's, and that's a kind of a big, caveat to this whole thing is because the forgiveness process goes through the banks. And so the banks really hold the cards as to what they, um, what they need. You know, if, uh, if you submit your application and you think you've given them everything that they sh should have, and they might come back and say, well, no, we need some more. And you just kind of have to do it because they hold the cards. So and, until they're ready until they feel ready to, to process these things through the SPA, they're probably not going to accept them. Okay. Is there a slide that you want to go on to, Mike, or do you want us to just keep firing questions at you? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the, the end of, of what I had. I mean, as I said at the top, I, I had dreams of multiple slides of all the resolution to all the open questions that we had. <laughs> and we just haven't, we haven't got there. We're, we're in a holding pattern. We're just sitting back and, and waiting for Treasury and the SBA to, to tie up these loose ends for us. Um, there are some folks that are in a situation where they can, where they can um, apply and get full forgiveness, but even as we just said, I mean, even then, maybe the banks aren't ready for it. Um, so Jeff, maybe we've got a couple questions for you. I mean, there are some questions here. What do I need to substantiate? Uh, you know, is it 941s? Is it a pseudo form? Is it a payroll report? What kind of things are you seeing, you know, as you go through loan applications and filling out the loan? What, what kind of documentation are you really seeing get put together? Yeah, so the big one that we ask for is the payroll reports to substantiate the amount spent on payroll and then um, the uh, 
any payments made, confirmations of payments for the non-payroll eligible expenses, um, such as the rent, utilities, um, and mortgage interest. That's what you know we asked for, um, as well as what we mentioned the bank um, asked for as well. Um, each of the application instructions has a list of documents that you have to submit with, uh, with your forgiveness application. And those are the things that I mentioned um, as well, so. Okay, great. And then as far as what qualifies, let's say somebody is, is well under the $100,000 annual wage, so we don't have to worry about that. But, you know, we've, we've paid them overtime. So in the past, maybe they made $5,000 or now we're paying them six or $7,000 during the covered period um, because of either hazard pay or overtime pay. Is there an issue with that? Does their, do their wages have to stay at their same level or can they go up? Um, well, from a forgiveness perspective, we have to cap them at 15385 for the eight weeks. And then, um, yeah, for the 24 weeks, also that 20000 I believe, cap. Um, if it, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, that, they still have, they can't be making annualized more than $100,000. So we just have to cap that at those amounts. Right. But if they were and, making the annualized 20 and now they're annualized 25, we get, we get to use that higher amount. Yeah. Yeah. You just can't go over a hundred. Sure. Yeah, we do. The, the SBA, that was, um, that was something that came out in one of the, the Q and A's in the, in the um, SBA guidance is, is that you can um, choose to, they even use the word hazard pay. Um, or bonuses or additional amounts. And all subject, of course, as Jeff said, to that $100,000 cap. So I, I think Treasury's idea was, is that the $100,000 cap is enough of a limit on um, employers going, going haywire on this. So if you choose to um, give your employees a bonus during this time, that's okay. Even if, like Tom said, they, you made, they made 20 grand last year. Now you're paying them at a, a rate of 25. That's, that's fine. Um, SBA has said that's okay. It's all payroll. It's all compensation. So subject to that $100,000 cap. And along those compensation lines, you know, we, we think of wages in box one, taxable wages versus social security wages versus something else. I believe it is really like the box one wages that we're talking about, but I might be wrong on that. Can you tell me which, what, what is wages? The, the figure we're using um, is actually gross wages, which is a number that's, that's even, it's not even on the W-2. <laughs> box one, you've reduced for all your pre-tax stuff, right? Your yeah. you know, 1Ks and your, your medical and things like that. So, um, if you start with box one, then you have to add all those things back because what we're trying to get to is your, your gross wages, um, per employee. So it's, it's really before any kind of pre-tax reductions. Um, and it, it, if they're over a hundred, it doesn't matter because you know, you're just going to cap them at, at the cap, but for your employees that are, that are, uh, under a hundred a year then yeah, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you get everything um, that it really is gross wages. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Jeff, as you've been going through, um, are you seeing more people being able to use the EZ form? Is that? Risky? Yeah, um, yeah, we see quite a few of them. Um, we like to try to start with the EZ form, but if they can't certify the ones on the screen, then we move to the uh, regular form and, and do the FTE reduction quotient and reduction of salary wages. Okay. Okay. And we're seeing some questions about just the, the transfer of money and who, or have you actually spent the loan proceeds or have you spent your, your cash reserves from beforehand? And I, I think that answer is that there isn't any pure guidance on that. So Mike, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because most of the banks or a lot of the banks had people open a new account to deposit their PPP loan in probably because they got the, they may have gotten their PPP loan, not from their regular bank. Right. Right. Especially in, when a lot of the big banks right out of the, out of the chute were hesitant or not, not really reacting very quickly to, to the PPP program itself. 
um, a lot of people ran to the smaller banks that were way more interested in, in, in getting this done. Um, so yeah, the, the quick answer is, is there's no, there's no tracing of dollars or anything like that in here. Um, it was kind of uh, considered a best practice to take your PPP money and put it in a separate account so that you could you know, document the expenditures as, as they went out, um, makes, makes it easier. Um, but there's, there's really no, there's no tracing at all. So you could have got your PPP money, left it in that bank and then gone about your business and made all your payroll and utilities um, and rent expense out of your other funds. Um, and that's perfectly okay. The, 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 the key is to have spent money on eligible expenses and be able to, to document that. Like Jeff was saying, the, the, um, the document of your expenditures. So. Oh, great. So Jeff, I've got a, a little more complicated question for you. Um, so, so I'm going to give an example. Let's say that somebody borrowed, their, their loan was $100,000. And during their covered period, let's say it's a 24 month covered period, they actually spent on payroll 120,000. So, so they spent more than their loan amount, but they reduced their FTEs. So let's say their FTEs were only uh, 75%. So they get 75% loan forgiveness. If you take 75% of 100,000, that's the loan amount that 75,000 is forgiven and 25,000 would be paid back. Or do you take 75% of the 120,000 you actually spent, you get 90,000 out of your 100,000 forgiven. I think we're only gonna get 75% forgiven, but I just I wanna hear if, if that makes sense to you, what, what that question is. Um, the second part didn't really make sense. The one where you talk about the 75% uh, off of the 120, Right, so they spent 120,000 on payroll during their 24 week covered period, but I think we're gonna get just the, the 75,000 forgiven. Right, I mean, we can compute the numbers uh, through the different scenarios and figure out, you know, between eight weeks, 24 weeks, which, um, you know, what gives you a better advantage. And there's different reference periods you can use as well when you can FTE. Um, you know, there's different um, refer point of reference periods you can compare to from even to 2019 um, to show less of a reduction. Um, is that that's the period that you're going to want to use, and that would help limit your amount that's non forgivable. Yeah, Tom, this is a this is a question that somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, and I, I kind of scratched my head about it and and thought about it, and it's not it's not clear. I mean, the statute itself says you can't get any more forgiveness than your loan amount. I mean, which makes sense, but the FTD reduction test applies to forgive, you know, forgivable expenses, which in your scenario, you said you've got 120 of potentially forgivable expenses that are capped at, you know, your forgiveness is capped at hundred, but if I've got 120 of forgivable expenses, is that the number that I slap my reduction on? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, I think the, the conservative view would be, yeah, you're, you're stuck at your 75,000 of forgiveness, but they might, um, they might clarify, they, they, might, they might go the other way. You don't know. So I, I think that's unanswered. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple taxable income questions in here. Um, so the first one is, is there any update on the loan forgiveness being a, you know, non-taxable or taxable. So Mike, you wanna run, yeah. we know on that one. Right, um, no update. Um, the IRS came out with a, with a notice, I can't remember exactly when it was, but they, they said, yeah, the, the CARES Act itself says right in it that the forgiveness of this loan is not taxable income. The IRS did their analysis and said, sure, that's true, but the expenses you pay with those forgiven dollars 
are not deductible for tax purposes. So it ends up having the exact same effect as if the forgiveness itself was taxable. It has the same tax impact. Um, and right after the IRS came out with that, the, there were a, a bunch of members of Congress saying, oh, no, yeah, that's, that's not what we intended. We wanted this to be tax-free and the expenses should be deductible. So I, I know on the Senate side, um, the, in, a bill was introduced right away that would re reverse the IRS's conclusion. Um, and I, I believe there was some language in some legislation that passed the House that said the same thing. Um, but nothing has gone through the process yet and actually become law. So where we're sitting right now is that the forgiveness itself is not income, but the expenses you pay with forgiven dollars are not deductible. And that's, I think what you just, we should just plan on that um, just to be, to be conservative. Um, I, I, I don't know what the, what the odds are of, of that legislative fix going through. No. Heard our, our national, um, our national uh, group, the AICPA, I was on a, a webinar with them not too long ago where the person there said, you know, if you would have asked me three or four weeks ago, I would have said there was a 90% chance that it would get fixed. But now maybe it's more like 50-50. And, and I think the thought process there was um, that some of the budget hawks in, in Congress are starting to take a, some look at this. And, you know, it's like, wow, if we, it's bad enough for pumping you know, hundreds of billions of dollars out there. If we let them deduct the expenses, that's, you know, that's many more billions um, uh, out of the fisc. So I think there's, there's some pushback. And so it wouldn't shock me if those expenses remain non-deductible. Yeah. And it's really going to be interesting. The other question here was, okay, so let's say it's, it's taxable income in what year? So you get, and this is applicable for if the loans are forgiven in 2021, if the actual forgiveness paperwork goes through in 2021 for calendar year taxpayers, but it's also very real for fiscal year taxpayers as well, because I think it's pretty clear that Mike, like you said, the law says that the, the loan forgiveness is not taxable income, but the expenses are not deductible. Well, you've paid the expenses before the loan was forgiven. So I think that one's an open question. We just don't have an answer for that. Right. Yeah, we don't. It's a really intriguing problem, though, because those expenses are totally deductible until you get your forgiveness. So if, if, you've, if you're in a fiscal year, if you're in a June 30th fiscal year, you spent all your money or a bunch of your money before June 30th, that should be deductible. And, but then, you know, down the road, you get forgiveness. And then do you have to amend your return? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how they're going to deal with that. So. Yeah. And I think this is a question that we've dealt with a number of times. If you have a retirement plan contribution for 2019 that you accrued on your books for 2019, you pay it by your extended due date of September 15th, and you decide, hey, let's pay it in May. In May of 2020, during this eight-week covered period, tell us if, if that's a good retirement plan um, that can be forgiven. I think from what we know now, yeah, if it was paid during the covered period, it would, it would go into the forgiveness pot. Um, I, that has been kind of a nagging question from the get-go because of that very situation. We have a lot of people that are paying, but that's how they, how they do it. They, they accrue their 2019 profit sharing contribution and it's a 19 issue, but they don't pay it till the following year. Um, the, the statute reads, you know, retirement contributions paid during the covered period or, you know, incurred, but that's an or, you know, so um, I expected an answer on that a long time ago and, and haven't, haven't seen anything. Um, so I think that's just one more unknown but it's, it's a known unknown. I mean, people have been asking about that, so I would expect that to be addressed. Just 
Okay. Do you guys have, have any other thoughts on that? I mean, it's, you know, it's clearly not incurred during the covered period. It's incurred a year ago. But. Right, and, and that kind of leads to the next question. Um, and I think it's the same, similar kind of logic of the answer. Um, in your eight week period, if you pay weekly, you might have more than eight weeks worth of pay. And I think they have allowed us to take, to be beneficial to the taxpayer on this one, that you might get more. So it's paid or incurred. It's not paid and incurred. Yeah, and, and the incurred piece goes at the end of the covered period. So, and, and there's no similar thing to the front end of the covered period. So if you get to the end of your covered period and you have wages that are incurred before the end of your covered period, but they're paid on the next regular pay date, you get to include those. But other, other than that, you're gonna look at what's paid. So, for example, if you get your loan on a Thursday, and your first payday is the, is the next day, the Friday, for the previous week's wages, you know, which is before the covered period, you're still gonna to get to include those because it was paid during the period on the front end. And then you might end up something, something similar at the back end where you know, you're incurring wages, but they're cut off you know, on a couple of days before payday you'll still get to use those wages for those days that fall within the covered period but are paid on the next regular pay date. So I think in a lot of cases, there will be more than eight weeks of payroll. Okay. Jeff, have you been going through this process? Are there things that you wanna tell people about that uh, maybe we missed or we didn't get a chance to cover today? Um, yeah, I would like to talk a little bit more about, I know we talked to, you know, mentioned it briefly about the two, uh, $2 million threshold for SBA audits. And, um, you know, we really don't know exactly, you know, and how and when the SBA will come do these audits, but they have indicated, you know, that they want to review all loans over $2 million. And I think a lot of that was to deter, you know, abuse when you see of all these companies that clearly didn't need the money started to take it. I think that was, you know, primarily the rationale before is that they want to review ones that, uh, you know, that obviously have a higher dollar amount that they could potentially find that you didn't need that money. You should have never gotten it. Therefore, you have to pay it back. Um, you know, I would say unless there's some sort of fraud going on, you know, which you would hopefully know about, then, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about anything there from a criminal standpoint. If the worst case scenario, if they audit you and find that, you know, you didn't need the money, um, in their opinion, you didn't need the money um, due to whatever rationale they find, you know, you'll just have to pay it back. So it might make sense, um, you know, for you guys to consult with us if you are concerned about a potential SBA audit, you know, we can help you kind of rationalize and prepare and gather the supporting documentation that you need um, to uh, potentially answer some of their questions. And so um, just keep that in mind. We're not sure when those will be coming down the pipe, but, um, you know, they do have, they have indicated a willingness and desire to, to look at that. So if you did take over $2 million, you might want to might want to speak with us just given the amount of money that's at stake um, in this in this type of situation. Yeah, I think mean, that's exactly right. And just to um, and follow up again, if, if you have questions that we didn't get to um, or something that you think of later, please shoot us an email at, at learnmore at bluelightgroup.com and and we'll circle, circulate that amongst us and, and get an answer to it. Um, really thank everybody for, for coming in today. Um, we're right at our hour. We don't want to want to go over. People, people are busy, but we really uh, appreciate your time and, and your questions. Hopefully everybody picked up some information that, that we have or we're Hoping we were hoping to be able to give you a lot more um, based on guidance that we're we're still expecting, and uh, I, I think we're just kind of we're in the middle of the process now, and we've got a ways to go, and hopefully uh, get everybody resolved. And, and, and at some point, all of us will be able to look at the PPP program in the rearview mirror. So, with great fondness, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. thanks everybody yeah. thank you.